Um, so let me first start by saying that, yes, since I just got here, uh, the first thing you do is give a lot of talks, and you give a lot of talks before you get here. So let me apologize to anyone who's actually had to sit through this many times before, and I'm very happy to see that David Stern is not in the audience, because I think he's actually seen it more often than I've given it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so again, yeah, I'm going to be talking about Abel kinase, and basically my interests, which are the cytoskeleton and how it's regulated and how that affects processes that are involved in cancer and, and, and uh, specifically cell morphology and migration. Uh, let me start by saying that I have not yet tapped into the enormous amounts of drug company money for worm research, um, but I'm sure I'll have millions of bucks in, in a month or so. Um, so. So this is the thing that I study, C. elegans. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it, some not so much. There already are two well-established labs in the cancer center that work on this, Frank Slack and Joanne Wittes. Um, this guy is only a millimeter, or, well, guy and girl, they're hermaphrodites, uh, is only a millimeter long. Uh, and I think the reason that I would study this is not because I'm fascinated by worms, but because there are things you can do in worms much more easily than you can do in other systems. Specifically, you can look at things in vivo. You can really look at how cells interact with each other and how cells are functioning in a living organism in a way that it's much, much more difficult to do in mammals. And the reason it's easy to do these things in vivo is that, number one, worms have an invariant lineage. And that means that we know when every single cell in the worm is born, we know when every cell divides, we know where and when every cell migrates, um, and in, in many cases, which cells regulate how other cells do that. Um, and so if you really want to know on a cell level what's going on, there are things you can do there. Also, it's, it's very easy to mutate these things, either by RNA interference, um, which is comparatively new, or by uh, regular mutation. And they're really easily propagated, which sounds trivial, but if you're working on something that's really important, like Abel kinase, for example, um, or other kinases, in other animals, they'll just be dead. Whereas worms, they basically, all they have to do is eat, because they don't even have to mate with each other. They're hermaphrodites. So you can do a lot of things for that reason. And, and what I studied, because I'm interested in the cytoskeleton, um, is the engulfment of apoptotic cells. So here's um, a sad, dying, or dead cell. Here's the engulfing cell. And what you need for one cell to engulf another one is the cytoskeleton has to be rearranged, and you have to recruit membrane to go around that cytoskeletal rearrangement. And this, by the way, is really the same process that occurs when cells migrate um, and when cells change morphology. Obviously, two hallmarks of cancer. And we know, uh, originally based on data from worms, but then it's been confirmed in mammals that there are at least two pathways that are conserved uh, for this process to occur. One of them ends on RAC. I'm only going to use the mammalian names of these proteins. RAC is a small GTPase, uh, vital for actin cytoskeletal regulation. And dynamin is um, a, uh, a GTPase involved in uh, membrane recruitment and vesicles. And I should say that there's actually a long tree of proteins that, that, that you know, interacts with these things, but I'm just showing you the ones that I think are most important for the talk. And the way I got into studying Abel kinase is that we know that in mammals, we know that these two proteins, something called CRAC2 and RAC, are important for cell migration, and we know that Abel kinase in mammals inhibits CRAC2 by phosphorylating it. So let me say a little bit about Abel. I think a lot of us are familiar uh, with Abel because this regulation of Abel by fusion to the BCR protein causes, if not all, then the vast, vast majority of chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML. It also causes about 30% of adult acute lymphocytic leukemia, uh, or uh, Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL. What people may not be as familiar with um, are emerging data that um, ABLE is downregulated in a lot of breast cancer cell lines, and it's normally upregulated or active in normal breast tissue. So if you activate ABLE in these breast cancer cell lines, you can prevent proliferation and, and cell migration. Um, as opposed to that, in, cancer, in uh, lung cancer cell lines, some of them, act activation of ABLE actually causes proliferation. And something that matters to me, because I work in genital urinary oncology, and bleomycin is um, a drug used for testicular cancer, is that um, it turns out that bleomycin causes lung fibrosis, and that might be able to be attenuated by inhibiting ABLE. So what is ABLE doing, and how can it have all these different effects, and actually what seem to be opposing effects? And I think the answer to that is, is, is in sort of what we already do know about ABLE, though I think there's a lot we don't know. So one is that it's a very complicated protein, has multiple protein binding domains, a, a tyrosine kinase domain, it binds to DNA, it's found in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. 
by my count, over 70 proteins have been reported to interact with ABLE, though most of that is in vitro. So we don't know the physiologic significance of, of, of a lot of these, of frankly, most of these interactions. Um, it's been implicated in a huge number of cellular processes. Here are three of the most, most prominent ones. Cell migration, in some contexts, it's pro-apoptotic. In other contexts, it's anti-apoptotic. And um, transcription, also. And again, as I said before, ABLE blocks cell migration by phosphorylating CRAC2. Um, and so I think the reason you can see all these different effects from ABLE, of course, is that it's probably doing a lot of different things in different cellular contexts. And I think what is clearly not known is in vivo, in an organism, when it's doing what and, and, and how. So what do I look at? Well, again, I'm looking at this engulfment of apoptotic cells, and it's a really simple assay. I just want to show you sort of what I do. Um, these are the heads of newly hatched worms. Um, they're a little bit smaller than this in real life. And you can see a wild-type animal. There are some structures, but it basically looks pretty clear. Here's an animal that has a crack 2 mutation. Um, and you can see these little dots. And those are unengulfed corpses. Um, if you couldn't see them, you might be able to see them here. And the nice thing about this assay is, number one, it's easy. But number two, it's quantitative. So the more defective you are in engulfment, the more of these blobs you actually see. Um, and <clears throat> so here's a, a piece of data. Um, and the question was, is ABLE affecting this pathway, right? So here are wild-type animals. You look at them, they don't have any cell corpses in, in their heads when, when they hatch. Here is an animal with a, a mutation in RAC, not a, not a, a null mutation. Null RAC animals are, are dead. But these guys have about 20 unengulfed cell corpses in their heads. And then if you knock out ABLE at the same time, you see only eight corpses. So this suggests that ABLE inhibits engulfment normally, right? You, you remove ABLE, engulfment is actually improved, and therefore ABLE is some sort of inhibitor of engulfment. So we're about halfway to the original hypothesis, which is that ABLE normally inhibits CRAC2, and CRAC2 normally activates engulfment. So <clears throat> let's do a thought experiment before I actually show the data. Um, if that's really the case, first, if you knock out CRAC2, you're going to get an engulfment defect, which you can clearly see because engulfment is now at an angle. Um, if in fact, ABLE acts on CRAC2 directly, then you really expect that it really wouldn't make any difference, right? The engulfment defect shouldn't be any different if ABLE normally inhibits something that isn't there. And what do we see? Um, no, we don't see that. So CRAC2 actually, um, you see about 22 corpses in um, knockouts of CRAC2, and you see fewer in the CRAC2 ABLE double, and that's pretty significant. And therefore, you can conclude based on this and, and by the way, this is sort of one of about 15 or 20 pieces of confirmatory data, um, that ABLE is acting in parallel. And so here's this thought experiment now. Sure enough, you know, you knock out CRAC2, we know this, engulfment gets worse. Um, and then if you knock out ABLE, engulfment isn't as bad anymore because you've released this inhibition. So how about something more directly compared, to, com you know, comparable, which is cell migration to what happens in mammals. And we can look at cell migration in a lot of different cells in the worm, but one very easy one to look at is the distal tip cell. And this cell, as the worm uh, gets older, it moves. And as it moves, it forms these U-shaped gonads. That is, the gonad is formed behind this distal tip cell. So even though this is happening over 36 hours, all you got to look at, at is the end result, because in the end result, um, if it's migrated wrong, the gonad will be shaped funny. And in fact, you see that in mutants in this RAC pathway. Um, it makes this funny extra loop, and it can happen in the back or the front of the animal. I've, I've shown it here. Here's a wild-type animal, and that's a normal gonad shape, the U. And here's one with a crack 2 knockout. And I don't know if you can tell so easily, but it sort of stops here and then comes out that end. Um, I've kind of drawn it. You've got to trust my drawing. So does ABLE have an effect on this? And the, the answer is yes. And the black bars here represent animals with wild-type ABLE function. The white bars are animals with ABLE knockout. And if you look at a wild-type animal, um, with or without ABLE func functioning, you don't really see much effect on DTC migration. If you look at CRAC2 animals with wild-type ABLE function, or RAC animals with wild-type ABLE function, you see a lot of their gonad arms are misplaced. And then, if you knock out ABLE with these guys, then you see a, a, quite a bit of a decrease. So knockout of ABLE suppresses the defect, and therefore ABLE is pro probably suppressing migration. And once again, it's acting in parallel, right? Because you can knock these guys out. Well, knock this guy out, and knocking him out still has an effect. So suffice it to say, I also checked the Dynamon pathway. Once again, ABLE was acting in parallel. 
the question at this point in my work was, well, what is it acting through? Because these um, guys and about 10 or 15 other proteins all work through these pathways, and they've been known for about 15 to 20 years. And so <clears throat> something new was probably going on, and I used a scientific approach called a guess, and <clears throat> or we, we actually call it a candidate approach. But, um, and, and I looked at a protein called ABI, and the reason I looked at it is that we know that ABI is a cytoskeletal regula regulator, and it was actually initially identified as an able interactor. Um, and for the Kanishenti in the audience, these are all uh, actin cytoskeletal regulators, um, and all of which are known to uh, act with ABI. So does ABI have an effect? Well, you can't test ABI by knocking it out because the animals die as, as early embryos. But you can do something that's pretty cool called feeding RNAi. Um, and this is RNA interference that's done in a way um, that barely knocks down the gene function at all. And basically, it works on, on, on the fact that normally the dietary source for, for worms um, is E. coli. And you can put a plasmid into E. coli with your favorite gene, or YFG, uh, with promoters on either side, make lots of double-stranded RNA. Um, the worms eat the E. coli containing lots of double-stranded RNA. And then, um, amazingly, you get a knockdown. So you can do um, RNAi in worms just by feeding it to them, probably because they have a, a one-cell-wide gut. So what was the result when I looked at ABI? Well, again, wild-type animals, if you look at their engulfment, they have no uh, unengulfed cell corpses. And ABI RNAi, again, very weak, but had a very, very modest effect. Nothing really to write home about. This is one unengulfed corpse in every other animal. But we can test it in all the animals that are already partially engulfment defective, so using a sensitized strain. And so here's an example of that. With crack 2 you see about 23 of these corpses in their heads. And then if you, knock, if you knock down ABI just a little bit, it dramatically increases to 32. So again, the conclusion is that ABI was acting in parallel to these and that it's in fact an engulfment gene. And, and I'm not going to show the data because there isn't time, but using something called epistasis analysis, it looks like able inhibits ABI. And so the, the things that I think are, are, are relevant and, and uh, worth taking home is that so this is a, a new role for ABLE. Um, and it's one that, in fact, has been shown in vivo. So we know it's probably, it's certainly real in worms. It's still a question of whether it happens in mammals. Um, it's also probably the first engulfment pathway to be discovered in 15 or 20 years. Um, and lastly, and probably most importantly to me, what I think is the most relevant, is that this kind of study allowed us to find that ABLE was doing something that we knew it did in the past. It inhibited migration, but we found out that it was doing it in an entirely different way. And the kind of studies that you do in cell lines, it's actually quite difficult to make these kind of conclusions, whereas um, using knockouts, doing it um, this way, it's easier to find these sort of things. So let me say a little bit about what, what I'm doing now and, and, and what uh, I hope to do in the future. Um, so um, one of the things that's sort of obvious to do, we know that in mammals, ABLE and ABI have lots of proteins that interact with them. And we know a lot of these proteins have homologs in worms. There are 45 in worms for ABLE and 15 for ABI. And we're just looking at those. And we're knocking them down either by RNAi or knocking them out by mutation. Um, one interesting protein that's now being worked on by a summer student in my lab, Emma Sowen, is something called Sybil. Um, and Sybil is a ubiquitin ligase that downregulates the EGF receptor um, in both mammals uh, and worms. So that obviously is an important uh, cancer gene, and we'll see how that works. We have some preliminary data now. Um, I also did two genetic screens, uh, one of which is a classical genetic screen to look for suppressors of engulfment. And, um, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the reason to do this sort of screen is that we know that ABLE suppresses engulfment. Maybe we'll find either things that act with ABLE or things that act in parallel to ABLE and other pathways that do the same thing. Um, and uh, I screened 20,000 genomes, isolated 200 strains, and we have 18 that seem real. And right now, the, the job is to map these things, find out what the mutations are, and characterize them. And that's being done by a postdoctoral fellow uh, in my lab, Elena Simeonato. Um, another screen that I did is an RNAi screen for synthetic lethality. And the rationale behind this is that we know that ABLE is important. We know it does a lot of different things, and yet worms that you knock out ABLE on basically do fine. Um, they're pretty much indistinguishable from, from other worms. And so our assumption is that Whatever it's doing that's important for survival of the animal, there's some other pathway that's doing the same thing. Um, and so we figure we knock out that other pathway and we'll get dead worms. And therefore, anything that we find in a synthetic lethality screen should be something that is acting 
in parallel to ABLE molecularly, but doing something that's actually similar functionally. And um, again, it's done using this feeding RNAi, and we have libraries um, of E. coli, and basically you feed ABLE worms and wild-type worms the same E. coli that contain the same genes, and any gene that kills, or any double-stranded RNA or RNAi that kills ABLE, but not wild-type worms, is a synthetic lethal. Um, and I identified 108 genes out of, I think we screened 17,000 genes. Um, and, and, and many of them are things that I'm inherently interested in, cytoskeleton, signaling, anything that's conserved but we don't know what it's doing is obviously could be interesting. Um, and then of course a list of other things, which is what you always get with these crazy screens. But uh, we have yet to characterize these. Um, one other thing that I'm doing that I'm pretty excited about is a collaboration with a lab in Germany, um, lab in Matthias Mann, who is uh, mass spectroscopy expert, sorry about that. And um, what we're doing here, and I think no one's ever done this before, is taking a, a whole animal and looking at the effect of a single kinase on all the proteins that are phosphorylated in that animal. And basically, you can knock out ABLE in, in these worms, the worms are fine, and we're going to give them ABLE knockout worms, wild type worms, and they're going to give us a list of genes, or proteins really, that are differentially phosphorylated between these two strains. Um, and again, no one's really looked at this globally before. And, and the nice thing about the worm system, again, is that once they give us this list, we can take all those genes, knock them down, knock them out, overexpress them, express them, do whatever you want, and then look to see if they have effects on what we know ABLE is functioning in, or look to find other things that are going on. Um, and, and this is the work, the actual work that's being done on this is being done by my technician, Courtney Anderson. Um, and lastly, uh, I, although worms are, are fine and, and lots of fun, what we're really interested in is what's conserved and what's happening in mammals. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I have up and running an assay for mammalian cell engulfment. Uh, but what I have not yet done is perturb the system by looking at whether ABLE is required for it or other genes are required or other proteins that are known to be required in engulfment. And lastly, very lastly, is it relevant to clinical oncology? I say how is it relevant, but it's probably fair to put it the other way. I think the most obvious way is that, for example, in BCR-ABLE-driven disease, right, CML or ALL, you can basically cure early stage CML with the drug imatinib and, and similar drugs, and these block ABLE function. However, any late phase CML or really any of the ALLs are not curable, and presumably the main reason for this um, is not because this has lost the ability to be um, uh, blocked by imatinib. That happens sometimes, but a lot of it most likely has to do with other pathways that have become activated. And again, my screens are all aimed at finding these things. And so I'm hoping to find targets that when you knock them out in combination with imatinib, you might get at these diseases. And a similar thing can be said for breast cancer, where I think I said before that in normal breast, can breast tissue, this Efren B4 protein is on and activates C-ABLE to block survival and proliferation. And in breast cancer cells, many of them, this is not functioning. So once again, you have something where whatever ABLE normally does that is required for survival versus what it's doing for inappropriate survival um, is on in normal cells but not uh, breast cancer cells. And so again, if you can find a parallel pathway that you can knock out that will only kill things in which ABLE is not functioning, you might be able to find a therapeutic that will kill breast cancers but not breast tissue. Um, finally, let me thank the people in my lab who are actually getting this stuff done. Um, Bob Horvitz, my mentor, uh, I cloned ABLE with uh, these people. This guy actually stopped, was uh, gone from the lab about eight years before I got there, but um, there are probably more things waiting to be done in the graveyard of the Horvitz lab than many other entire universities. He has just lots of stuff that no one ever does anything with. Um, I had a technician for two years, and uh, I got strains from these guys, and I was mostly funded by the NCI. Thanks.